Hey guys, it's Keith Rose. So today, we are here to dispel some rumors by the Western media by doing a comparison of the Hong Kong SAR national security law with those in other countries and look into the American hypocrisy in certain human rights issues using facts and logic. Because facts don't care about one's feelings. Just before we start today's video, we would like to clarify a few things regarding our position. First of all, we'd like to say that rationality does not imply neutrality. So while we have always promised to be rather centrist, we have never said that we are 100% neutral. All that we can promise is we always would base our arguments on facts and logic. We're only here to provide an alternative perspective towards the mainstream media. We do not claim that we're 100% correct, and in fact, we do make mistakes. The global narrative on the situation in Hong Kong has been way too one-sided. For example, in right-wing news outlets such as Fox News, and also on left-wing news outlets such as The Guardian, all of them portray a very specific image for Hong Kong, and we felt that we had to provide an alternative perspective to that, and show our global audience both sides of the coin. At the same time, we try to stay genuine to our own opinions, some of which may actually fit in with the global narrative. So at the end of the day, we're just trying to balance between these two objectives. We would always give credit to whoever deserves credit, and obviously that includes the Hong Kong protesters. At the same time, we recognize that no governments are perfect, and that obviously includes the Hong Kong government and the central government. And we would criticize whichever government that deserves criticism, including Western governments as well. In the future, we would also invite people with different opinions to come and have a dialogue with us because it has never been our intention to build an echo chamber. Exactly, we want to find some common ground. In fact, in our past few videos, not all our guests share one single opinion. For example, our Greek friends on Soft Talk, they've expressed their concerns for the national security law in Hong Kong, whereas our Italian friends support it. So therefore, in the future, we'll invite people who are both supportive and skeptical of China and Hong Kong into our videos. We believe that anyone should definitely speak out for their beliefs. Please remember to subscribe to our channel by pressing the red button below, like the video by giving a thumbs up, and also share the video with your friends and family members. But without further ado, let's begin. Claim number one. Some people have said that only the Hong Kong national security law targets people's freedom of speech, while those in the West do not. Therefore, we'll analyze the national security laws of different countries to see if this claim is actually true, and also hypothetically apply those laws to Hong Kong. So now, let's turn to some of the legal provisions in the national security laws of the United Kingdom, the Terrorism Act of 2006. Section 2, it creates this offense of the dissemination of terrorist publications. You cannot spread terrorist propaganda, which essentially means your freedom of expression in that regard is limited. But obviously, everyone would agree that it's justifiably limited. Now, some of them would say that this is a false equivalence because they would argue that the actions of the protesters in Hong Kong don't necessarily amount to terrorism. But I would like to point them to Terrorism Act of 2000, Section 1, Subsection 1, which defines terrorism as the use of threats of action designed to influence the government's for a political or ideological cause. Now, if that doesn't define the actions of some of the violent rioters, I don't know what does. And also, Section 1 and Section 2, terrorism involves serious damage to property, which basically when they burn anti-war stations or burn Chinese funded companies, that is serious damage to property, right? And also, secondly, when it creates serious risk of health or safety to the public. Now, most people in the West wouldn't know this, but the police actually found thousands of canisters of dangerous chemicals and homemade bombs in university campuses. So what that means is if they had carried out the same actions in the UK, not only would they not be allowed to spread their propaganda, but also they would be arrested in trial and rightfully convicted as terrorists. Next, I'll turn to the national security law of sedition in Spain, which nine Catalan independence leaders were eventually found guilty of by the Spanish Supreme Court in Madrid last year. I'll first read out the relevant Spanish legal provisions, accompanied by the corresponding English translations in the subtitles, and then I'll analyze by applying it to Hong Kong. Artículo 544, Código Penal de España. Son reyes de sedición los que, sin estar comprendidos en el delito de rebelión, se hacen pública y tomatoriamente para impedir por la fuerza afuera de las vías legales la aplicación de las leyes o cualquier autoridad, cooperación oficial o funcionario público, el legítimo ejercicio de sus funciones o el cumplimiento de sus acuerdos o de las relaciones administrativas o justiciales. 
Now, in Hong Kong, the new national security law does not cover the crime of sedition, even though it was listed in Article 23 of the Hong Kong Basic Law, which has not been passed to this date. However, let's imagine Spanish law can be applied to Hong Kong. Peaceful protesters will not fall far of this law, since it has to be by force or outside legal channels. Nor will they actually fall far of Hong Kong's national security law, since Article 4 protects our freedom of expression. Therefore, we are only talking about the minority sect of violent radicals. When they storm into the Legislative Council on the 1st of July for vandalism and then block off roads for officials to carry out their daily work, burn buildings off the courts and the Hong Kong judiciary, that is most definitely a public rise by force to prevent the application of the laws and also public officials to exercise their functions. This means if the Hong Kong rioters committed the same action in Madrid, the Basque County, Galicia, Andalusia, Catalonia or any part of Spain, they will likely have value the Spanish law of sedition. Worse still, they might be even charged with the Spanish crime of rebellion, which has a much higher maximum sentence. We also like to touch upon the idea that freedom of expression is supposedly an absolute right. And we believe that it's actually false because there is this idea that rights should be optimized as principles, right from Robert Alexi's writing. When a right comes into conflict with other interests or other considerations such as national security, the right doesn't necessarily overrule or trump that sort of other consideration. In fact, both considerations have to be balanced against each other. And the ideal end result is that the limitation on the freedom of expression or any other right would be proportionate to what needs to be done in order to preserve the other side of the scale. In national security law, we may limit freedom of expression to an extent which preserves our national security, but at the same time, people would still have that sort of right to free speech in general. Claim number two. The Hong Kong national security law is extremely vague. We actually kind of agree with this point and it is a valid concern. The Hong Kong judiciary must and will clarify such terms in order to reduce the fear of the general public. However, since some people often hope the US to come and sanction Hong Kong, we we'll do a comparison with the national security laws in the US. The US with the Patriot Act of 2001, which is their response to the 9-11 attacks. So it, it is also a national security legislation. There are also lots of great areas. It renders it illegal for citizens to provide what's called material support, including giving advice on how to resolve disputes peacefully to any organization which is designated as a terrorist group by the Secretary of State. This is very arbitrary because the Secretary of State can simply designate anyone or any group as a terrorist organization and then anyone who provides any sort of advice, whether malicious or not, would immediately be legally liable yeah. for that. That is a huge limit, a huge interference with freedom of speech. In an article which was written a few years ago, the author suggests that the way the U.S. government interprets the law is itself so complicated that an average person would have a hard time knowing for sure what is a crime. Now, that makes sense because providing material support is such a broad definition. Yeah. It's so broad stroke that no one would actually have a clear idea what that entails. Claim number three. Some people have the idea that in order for a government to be so-called democratic, it must affirmatively respond to whatever demands its people make. There isn't a single democratic regime in the world that bends its knees to whatever demands its citizens make, especially when those who disapprove their actions don't verifiably constitute a majority. This is why we have constitutional provisions which often require a two-thirds majority in the legislature to alter that in the United States and many countries as well, and also some provisions which simply cannot be disposed of. For example, according to Articles 1 to 19 of the German Constitution, these articles may be amended but not removed. Any amendment may not affect the essence of these rights. So some things are constitutional red lines. In Hong Kong, the red line is sovereignty. One country, two systems. The demons cannot make irrational or unreasonable demands and then expect the government to kowtow to the oi poloi. Imagine if the Hong Kong people voted to have all blue-eyed babies killed and we had pure majoritarian democracy. What should end up is Nazi Germany, where the minority gets oppressed by the majority. So is that something we want in Hong Kong? Obviously not. We do not want an ochlocracy because democracy requires well-reasoned participants. Otherwise, it is nothing but democracy. Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers of America, actually favored restricting voting to those who could actually have a free exercise of their reason. 
Like for example, he wanted to restrict voting to those who were well educated and were sufficiently rational to form a valid opinion. And Socrates also, we mentioned this in one of our previous videos, he said that democracy is meaningless when its participants refuse to exercise their rights responsibly. I want to distinguish between democracy and republic, because they're two different things. James Madison has said that a republic is preferable to a democracy because the latter often allows the emergence of, quote, an interested and overbearing majority. So factionalism, reflected by those, seeks to divide Hong Kong society into two antagonistic camps, is best constrained by constitutional principles and delegated decision making. This is from Federalist Number 10, 1787. There is no true democratic nation. All countries are more or less republics, including the United States, and supposedly, but through executive orders and also federal agents, the US is being dominated by the democratically elected president. Now, is this a good thing, or would that be better for the democratic representatives to be restrained by the rule of law instead? You think for yourself. The idea of a pure majoritarian democracy First of all, it's not embraced by any Western liberal democracy, and secondly, it's counterproductive to the well-functioning and good governance within a democratic society. Claim number four. Westerners blindly believe Western media is impartial. However, it is in fact very biased. We'll now have a look at two BBC hard talk interviews and see the differences in the attitude of the interviewer. Do you worry about the idea that you encourage your fellow um, pro-democracy activists to take to the streets to challenge the authority of the new security law while you're thousands of miles away in safety. For me I do not en encourage any forms of violence. There were so many personal threats po imposed on me. Now we do commend Nathan's refusal to condone the acts of violence which have been carried out by his counterpart and also we sympathize with the fact that he has been personally threatened by those who hold a different opinion and we do condemn said threats. But it must be said that there has been an abundance of similar cases coming from the other side. Now the interviewer Stephen Sackler, we also like to compare the way in which he handled himself in this interview with Nathan Law and his interview with Ronnie Tom. Now, uh, and yes, they are politically motivated. I have not finished. The legal, the legal I have not finished. And it is all ridiculous. Of the senior respected. There's no way to, to carry on an interview like this. You know, you should be ashamed of yourself. So as you can see, in the Ronnie Tong interview, the interviewee found it hard to talk. And that is why we have started Keyboard Soft Talk to counteract this. But anyway, we believe that interviewers and the media in general shouldn't be so obviously biased to render it hard for those who share a different opinion to express themselves on their shows. Claim number five. The Hong Kong police force has employed disproportionate force, and therefore, protesters are entitled to take matters into their own hands by responding in an equally or even more violent manner. We would like to reiterate very clearly on camera that we do support an independent commission outside of the current IPCC Gang Gangway system to investigate on alleged disproportionate use of force by the police in Hong Kong. No one is above the law and obviously that includes the police. So in that sense, we do actually agree with the theory of the protesters. We should not resort to vigilantism, because that's completely a different thing. Indeed, this has happened on both sides and we condemn such actions no matter which side they're on. This sort of arbitrary and personalised justice seeking is completely undesirable. The avoidance of such actions is why our ancestors found it beneficial for them to group together into societies and submit themselves to a coercive sovereign. Some total of benefits to all subjects and the civil society outweighs the costs. This is by Thomas Hobbes, 1651, Leviathan. Finally, rule of law, no matter how pervasively abused, is almost preferable towards the rule of mob. Claim number six. Some people, especially Western countries such as the United States, have said that China has not lived up to the international expectations in terms of human rights. Please remember that China is a civilization with more than 5,000 years of history of sophisticated, long culture. The West must recognize that we have differences in our values. We shouldn't say that the Western culture is better than the Chinese, nor should we say the Chinese culture is better than the West. We're just equal. All we ask for is just mutual respect and understanding. 
But contrast that with the United States, who have started numerous color revolutions and left hundreds of thousands of dead bodies in its wake. The U.S. has also committed various war crimes. For example, the Highway of Death in Iraq in 1991, where it bombed retreating armies in blatant violation of the Geneva Convention. This point was actually raised by former United States Attorney General Ramsey Clark, who said that the Highway of Death bombing actually violated Article. Three of the Third Geneva Convention, which outlaws the killing of soldiers who are out of combat. Next, we turn to the Vietnam War massacres in 1968 in My Lai. So there were 348 civilians murdered, raped. 26 soldiers were charged with criminal offences, but only Lieutenant William Calley Jr. was eventually convicted. He was found guilty of killing 22 villagers. He was originally given a life sentence, but served only three and a half years under house arrest. The U.S. unapologetically ignores international law in the U.S. and Nicaragua case law. Basically, the U.S. instigated the color revolution in Nicaragua. The U.S. was found to have interfered with Nicaragua's sovereignty. But because the U.S. blocks the enforcement of the judgments by the United Nations Security Council, Therefore, it prevented Nicaragua from obtaining any sort of compensation. Is that fair? The US simply uses its veto power to do whatever it wants, and the US never apologized at all. Now, I cannot understand why the United States has the audacity to criticize us for human rights abuses when itself does so much that is blatantly unacceptable in any civil society. Claim number seven. The protesters claim that all Hong Kong people support the sanctions by the USA against Hong Kong, and everyone in Hong Kong hates the mainland. Many of them suffer from something which is called a moral panic, which is the fear of an external threat to your way of life. That sort of moral panic and this sort of phobia, particularly against the mainland, has been engineered by moral entrepreneurs, including Apple Daily, who have specifically and intentionally engineered this sort of fear by feeding the public with one-sided information and propaganda. This sort of reflects the unjustified and irrational opinions are by no means rendered valid simply by virtue of the fact that they are being espoused by the majority. One thing I would like to add is that President Trump has recently pardoned some of the alleged war criminals from the United States Army who have been on trial for killing civilians indiscriminately. And I think this reflects that the American regime does not care about the welfare of those who are not Americans. This is exactly what happens when America intervenes in another country. They go in, bomb the hell out of them, massacre them, and they simply do not care about the human cost. Even if the majority of Hong Kongers wants the U.S. to come and so-called liberate them, it is absolutely unacceptable. Now let us imagine a hypothetical here. Imagine a UK politician going to China and asking China to sanction the UK. And not only that, but he also proclaims that the UK is such a terrible, unfree, liberal, oppressed place, and China has to do whatever it takes to sanction the hell out of the UK and then come and liberate the UK people. What would be the political and public response to this? Would he still be allowed to stand for election? I mean, maybe legally he would still be allowed to stand for election, but would the public accept him? More importantly, if this isn't treason, then what is? If any of you feel like sentencing individuals to life imprisonment according to the national security law is too much and is disproportional to the crime, allow us to remind you that the United Kingdom had a death penalty for the offense of treason until the Crime and Disorder Act of 1998 formally lowered the maximum penalty to life imprisonment. Claim number eight. The protesters claim that the mainland does not understand traditional Chinese culture, but this claim can actually be refuted by analyzing a Chinese saying that they often recite, which is, Be water, my friend. Sun Xin Ya Sou. The protesters are trying to basically appropriate ancient Chinese culture, even though they constantly deny their ethnicity by citing Baozi, while failing to comprehend what it actually means. So the meaning of the concept, Yi Kei Ba Zhang, Gu Tin Ha Mo Nang Yu Ji Zhang, definitely does not encourage or justify the throwing of petrol bombs, because according to the comments of Wu Sik, 
1918, and this means the rioters could actually inspire themselves from some of our ancestors' wisdom and also stop denying their Chinese roots. I've actually read the writings of Mu Xing um, in regards to his comments on Lao Tzu. And another quote from Lao Tzu, which he mentioned, was Now, according to Lao Tzu's philosophy, what he's essentially saying is that natural takes its own course, and natural has its own justice, which essentially is natural law in a nutshell. Now, what that means is, if the West or the Hong Kong people think that the Chinese Communist Party, or even mainland in general, is so terrible, then all you have to do is leave it to its own devices because eventually, according to Lao Tzu, nature will take its course and then the CCP will just crumble and implode like what many Western thinkers predicted 40, 30, even 20 years ago. But look at the CCP who continues to enjoy very high approval ratings from its citizens. According to Pew Research Institute, its approval rating has constantly been in the high 80s or even in the low 90s percentile. Claim number nine. The protesters assume that all Americans support them, but in fact, even Republican politicians disapprove of actions like this, which have been carried out by American rioters in the US. Here we have a post from Republican House of Representatives candidate Jen Crenshaw, who is from Texas. Here he condemns the use of political intimidation and violence and says that those who condone said actions ought to be disqualified from elections. He is most definitely correct. This can be applied perfectly well to Hong Kong, and it is very hypocritical for the U.S. Republican government to purport that certain candidates have been disqualified unjustifiably, because most, if not all of them, have at least implicitly supported the usage of political violence. Right, so this marks the end of our video. Thank you guys, and see you in our next video. Cheers, bye.